So I think now uh, we're going to move on to, uh, to our closing keynote. Yeah, and um, it's, uh, it falls to me to, uh, to, introduce, uh, to introduce Elizabeth. So today we're, we're very privileged to have Elizabeth Churchill uh, here to talk to us. She's Director of User Experience at Google, uh, former Executive Vice President of the Association for Computing Machinery, member of the ACM CHI Academy and an ACM Distinguished Scientist and Distinguished Speaker. So she's uh, extremely distinguished. <laughs> um, today, she's going to outline two developer focused systems and frameworks that she's built. Yeah, Material Design, that's Google's design system, and Flutter, yeah, a designer developer framework. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it to her to go beyond that, but she's going, to, uh, she's going to explain the approach and how this more developer focused, uh, focused approach differs from, from the user experience approach and, uh, and give us some examples of, of what she's been doing. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. And thank you very much for getting up pretty early on the West Coast of the US, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Stuart, thanks so much for the uh, invitation. Now I'm going to try and figure out how to um, actually get this to present. So I think this should work. Let's see. All right. Now it looks like you can see you can see um, all of the slides, right? How do I get this to just present the main slide? I, I don't use Zoom. <laughs> so. So how do I get this to present here so that you just see the main slide? If you try pressing F5. Pressing which? F F5. What's F5? <laughs> Everybody, I want to talk about user experience. <laughs> stop this and then let me hit this okay all right so you, can you guys see the slides no right now we can see you um all right let me do this again yes. apologies we did this it worked yesterday share screen here we go. Application window. Time tab. Here we go. Check. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's, it looks like you can see um, all. Of, you can see the slides down the side as well, which is a little annoying. But if I do present over here, well, we could just do it this way. So if I do present here, then I lose you, I think. No, I think yeah, if you present, a... present there, oh, that's fine. Yeah. We got yeah, it. That's fine. That's it. You did it. User experience. Yeah. This is collaboration. All right. Good. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning for me. Um, uh, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, it's a bit of a meta talk. It's um, about how we're adapting methods that are typically used for user experience for um, developer experience, designer and developer experience. Um, and we just heard some fantastic talks from students who are doing quite a lot of user experience and the things that they've been building. So my talk is really going to be how I've adapted some of those uh, things in my teams uh, to really think about the developer experience. And now Material Design and Flutter, I didn't build those, but um, I joined Google ooh, six years ago. And I came in to really start thinking about designer and developer experience, because I believe that if we give designers and developers excellent tools, then we can bake in great end user consumer experiences that are much, much better. So guidelines, sort of guardrails, these kinds of things for designers and developers. So that when they're actually producing um, end user consumer experiences for our personal devices, they actually um, are guided into doing the right thing for users. And uh, Ben was just talking about uh, you know, your PhD and how that may or may not go on into your future. 
Well, my PhD was uh, a long, long time ago, but it was all about uh, uh, programmable user models. So I feel like I haven't really come that far. I'm just doing it in a different context. Um, so this is just a quick short talk, and my goals are to share some perspective. What can developer experience or designer experience learn from user experience and HCI, human computer interaction? I'm going to talk about a little bit about material design and Flutter, and I'm going to give you some context there. And I'm just going to share some approaches. So it's like I said, it's a bit of a meta talk, um, which is some of the things that we've tried. We have published quite a lot of this work, either in um, conferences, um, a couple of journal papers are going to come out pretty soon, or um, on our blogs. So um, the specifics of the work or the results, some of which may or may not generalize to your context, seemed to be to be less interesting to talk about today rather than the adaptation of the methods and approaches. Um, and to just give you some background of how we're, we're doing this kind of work. But uh, if anybody wants to follow up with me on specifics, I can point you to blog posts and so forth. Um, so I'm going to spend about five minutes introducing material design and Flutter. Um, then I'm going to just do a little bit of a distinction between HCI, UX, and developer or design experience. And then I'll just share some of those methods. So that's the outline for the talk, and then I'll wrap up. So if you want to grab yourself a cup of tea, because anything doesn't sound interesting to you, that's about your time frames. All right. So what are material design and Flutter? So design systems, uh, visual design systems, so it came about ooh, early, like 2011, something like that. Um, and it's all about, you know, how do you design the screens for our personal devices, the interactions for our personal devices. And the idea of design systems is that you provide sort of consistency across a suite of experiences for users and potentially across a suite of products. So it might be tablets, phones, etc. This is, of course, very good and a great HCI, human computer interaction or UX principle, which is that buttons should look the same and people users, consumers, know what a button is and so forth. So here we see design systems tend to have like some kind of form. They define the shape, lines, texture, color palettes, um, which go into branding in particular, the spatial layout, things like motion and movement, and you can see here some of the motions. Um, you get uh, typography um, and fonts. Um, so all of these kinds of things, you know, are part of a design system. Interestingly, um, content is also um, part of a design system. So a lot of people who have come from the visual design backgrounds tend to think of these other elements, but they forget that content, and we have a lot of content writers in the team who think about how we present information. Now, material design, which is what you're seeing here, this was from a couple of years ago, a couple of version, it's morphed a little bit, but not a lot. Material design is Google's design system. Um, Google has many design systems, but this is the main one that's used by about 95% of our products at some level. Um, and this came out, was launched in 2014, and is now one of the most popular design systems. It's open source, available externally, and used by hundreds and hundreds of thousands of designers and developers around the world. Um, uh, what's interesting is that, as I say, it, it has a lot of detail. So our spec um, has a lot of detail about different kinds of buttons, different kinds of call to action for users, building a lot on human perception around what is salient and around how you take actions and what is the most important thing to look at on a screen. As I mentioned, we also do fonts. We have a very, very extensive font library. Um, it's actually quite fun to play with, so if you want to check out Google Fonts, um, it's just a very, I, I like playing around on the site. It's just fun to see different different kinds of styles and the personality of different fonts. Um, here are just some examples of the ways in which some of those motion elements uh, work. Uh, when you're actually, these are uh, made up examples to showcase what can be done. The other thing about um, design systems is uh, they, they allow you to scale very quickly, as I say, across multiple suites of products, um, and they give you consistency. But in terms of, for a designer and developer experience, what we have done in my team, there's been a bunch of studies that were done by um, a woman called Elisa Weinstein, who's interviewed designers and developers extensively. 
And she has shown that using a design system like material design can make your work much more efficient because you're not having to reinvent the wheel all of the time. You can actually take um, well-designed elements that have been tested by the team for the best user experience and use those. You don't have to go and uh, reinvent the wheel. Design systems are also really good for teamwork, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit in a second. But what we found out when we interviewed managers of large teams of designers and developers who are producing consumer experiences across multiple different screens or surfaces is that design systems actually take a lot of the friction out between design and engineering, design and development, because it's a, it's a central place where everyone can go and look at the spec and try things out, and there's a common language gets established between the world of design and engineering around what is trying to be achieved. The other thing is that uh, many design systems, not all, but many, and material design is one of them, actually we have the engineered components. So we have an engineering team as well as a, a, an extensive group of designers who actually build the components. So you can go and you can have a look in the, the Git repositories and see where those components are, the engineered components, and just plug and play. So I just put a link there in case anyone's interested in looking at those. And what we found from interviewing managers of teams was that the friction between the different disciplines reduces. Folks can actually focus on building what they want to build for the consumer. Um, as I say, common language is established. Um, and also, we see people a uh, lot less burnout because, as I say, people are not trying to reinvent the wheel under very high time pressure. So uh, really kind of important. Um, Flutter. So if that's our design system, as I say, from about 2014, and it's grown and extended quite significantly now, um, Flutter is more recent. Flutter is a UI toolkit uh, for building uh, natively compiled applications for mobile, web, desktop, from a single code base. Now, I think what's important about that, which I think if you, any of you have been working in this world of building these kinds of interactive experiences, is that one of the greatest pain points that we found in uh, interviews and so forth oh, four or five years ago was that designers and developers are having to redo work for all of these different platforms. Now, redoing everything for the different platforms not only feels very frustrating, it can also uh, introduce slight differences um, in the end user experience. Um, and some of those differences, especially if you're like me, you go across all of these different platforms, can just be a little disconcerting. But the main thing was, again, that efficiency angle. So Flutter helps you actually just build once um, rather than across all of the different um, areas. So we started research, and the lead researcher, uh, Tao Dong, on my team, uh, he I'm going to show some of the stuff that he has been doing in a minute. Um, he's got a small team. He started working on Flutter and doing uh, developer experience for Flutter about four years ago and has now built a small team. And that team is very deeply integrated with the Flutter uh, organization uh, to really bring the developer experience uh, right into the heart of Flutter. So it's been very much influenced by doing the developer experience work. And the three product pillars here are, is this expressive and flexible design and the high quality experiences that I mentioned, but it really is this high velocity development which I'm sure you know, uh, you know, getting things done faster and then critically testing if you're you know, in a sort of design or development house is really important. So just having given you the landscape of the kind of world that I work in and my teams work in, I wanted to just step back a bit because I didn't know how many folks, it seems like from the student talks, people are pretty familiar with human computer interaction and user experience, but I just wanted to sort of ground um, the, the ways in which uh, I bring the philosophy of uh, HCI and UX into the teams I build. Um, and so this is from Alan Dix from Swansea University. Uh, and I liked it because it's, it's very broad, but HCI is a multidisciplinary field focusing on the design of computer technology and interaction between users and computers. And initially, uh, we were like looking at, you know, gosh, uh, like the late 70s, I guess, and early 80s, I guess, when uh, HCI really became big. 
Um, we were all tethered to desks, uh, you know, with big screens and uh, not not on the internet. Uh, but anyway, now of course, uh, HCI uh, works on all kinds of devices, everything from you know home automation systems to cars to you know planes. All right. So um, uh, user experience uh, came about as a, an area later. It's a sort of child of HCI in many ways. And of course, we all know that it's really taken off as a field since probably the late 1990s. Um, and especially because of all of the devices that we have um, every day and we're carrying around in our pockets and bags. Um, but even though UX can get defined very narrowly to be just the interface interaction, um, especially if one comes from a visual design or interaction design background, actually a lot of UX really does have that bigger remit that HCI also has, which is a total user experience, even though the UI might be really important. And of course now, UX and HCI is dealing much, much more explicitly with multimodality, with uh, spoken commands. Uh, we heard a little bit earlier about gestures uh, and so forth. So, you know, it's a, it's a really, really sort of complex area. Um, and especially a complex area when you have devices that are truly multimodal. So I, this, this is a quote from a paper that I really like. So if people are interested in the space of developer experience, this is a great place to start from Brad Myers and team. And it's just from a few years ago. But um, uh, I love this fact that it's like, you know, they start off by saying developers are humans too. And software development languages and environments are the interfaces through which developers interact with computers. Because user experience uh, is very common now, we're familiar with it. But actually, this field of developer experience and of making more efficient, more effective, more delightful experiences for developers is really, really coming about. And as Brad Myers and team say very explicitly, we should take HCI and UX methods to make things better for developers. Now, I have two motivations for being in this field. One is, as I said earlier, you can really um, scale uh, user experience, consumer experience, by giving developers great tools. Um, the other thing is uh, that I think that by giving developers great tools, we create an environment that's much more inclusive because we know that humans problem solve in very different ways. And people like to use different kinds of tools. And if we give developers great tools, I think we're more inclusive. We invite more people uh, into the field. So those are my typical my, my motivations. So the areas that my teams look at in this space of developer experience are APIs, the tools that are actually being used themselves, um, and also the people and workflows. I mentioned earlier in the world of design systems, how uh, teamwork is improved by having design systems. Well, we do the same kind of thing with designer, developer collaboration, and with developer collaboration itself. So back to the methods. I set up a bit of a meta talk around some of the methods that we're using. This is a sort of you know layout that I tend to use to think about different kinds of uh, methods and approaches. It's not you know, truth, but it's an interesting way of sort of thinking about the different uh, available methods to us. Now, today I'm just going to touch on log analysis and the qualitative and quantitative remote tests that we do, usability tests, of course, and some ethnographic field studies, but also diary sampling studies. We do, especially for Flutter, we do surveys regularly. Um, we survey users and non-users, um, and we also do a lot of interviews. Um, not so much on the focus groups, but we have done those. Um, and there's definitely site analytics, but I'm not going to touch on all of these uh, today. So in the world of material design, here's an example of workflows. That's Sarah Cambridge, who used to work on my team. This is very much foundational work. So what we did here was we used an ethnographic and diary study, study methods. And we went out into um, agencies and other companies and talked to them about how they use material design, both their designers and their engineers. We talked about their collaborative um, landscape, and we found out a lot about what kinds of things that they're building. We also did this internally with some of our Google groups and did contextual interviews as well as ethnographic observations to really understand pain points. And one of the things that uh, we did was we had people, um, everyone used sticky notes for everything these days, but yeah, we uh, had people talk about their workflows, 
uh, talk about how uh, designs came about, talk about understanding, defining, designing, handoff and iteration between design and development. Um, and ended up coming up with this uh, workflow. Some of you might see this as familiar, where there's this emotional journey that goes on for designers and developers uh, through the production of a consumer experience or an experience of any kind, where everyone's excited at the beginning and then they get overwhelmed by the scope. And then there's technical constraints that are brought in because a great design may not be engineerable. Then you get some concept change buy-in, the design is approved, tracking design feedback, um, and that is a really key part, is tracking design feedback. Um, then you get developer buy-in on, for example, animation, and then you know, you've got the research, uh, uncovers some problems, because in this instance, research comes in a bit later. And then there's making design specs, and there's handoff to the developers, and then there's more issues. I'm sure you've all been through this iterative process. And this iterative process can cause friction between the design and development teams, and as I mentioned before. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, Google has invested in quite a lot is gallery. You can see uh, there's a, a, a link there to where gallery, you can learn more about gallery. But gallery really is a tool that tries to reduce that handoff friction at the iterative uh, stage between design and development by allowing all of the mocks, et cetera, et cetera, to be in one place that can be annotated and communicated around. Now, gallery um, basically replaced what we saw, what was happening, which is lots of emails with mocks attached, Google Drive folders with mocks attached, people looking at the wrong version of something. I'm sure you've all been familiar with this as well. Anyway, so a bunch of the work that we did has gone into refining and changing the features in gallery. Uh, so take a look if you have time. Uh, the other thing we've done is personas and workflow flows. I'm sure you're all uh, aware of the idea of having a persona where you create this sort of canonical or stereotypical person, and then you test your ideas against that person, that imagined person. This is a great paper to read if people are interested in this. It's actually a blog post. I put it at the bottom. Um, uh, it's quite critical of personas and for very good reasons. These personas were for Microsoft Visual Studio about 2005, and they came up with these ideas of Elvis, Einstein, and Mort, these three different kinds of developer who had different characteristics. Now, while the idea of a persona is a great idea to test your ideas out, um, having this rigidity uh, is quite problematic. And you should read the blog post, because a whole bunch of people were just super offended. As they said, I am not one of these people. Don't stereotype me. But that said, I do think the idea of personas is important. And we have done quite a lot of work ourselves on interviewing, observing, and looking at behavioral patterns and activity patterns to come up with personas. This is another example of trying to come up with spectra that matter across different personas. These were some from material design from a few years ago where we looked at people in large companies, small companies, whether this was a decision maker, like an executive, or somebody who's, for example, um, a novice uh, or a newly hired uh, engineer. So just to look at Isaac there, what I wanted to show you here was that with, when we had our personas and we started to create them, we started to really have these sort of uh, sliders along different dimensions that mattered. And we really, really baked in this idea that this person has a journey that they're going on or they're likely to go on. And using these kinds of much more detailed patterns, we looked at the journey of where they were likely to look on our site, material.io site. What would be their navigation path? What would be the documentation that they need? What would be the social support that they might need if we were going to do some collaboration work? If we were going to do collabs and videos and so forth, what would their needs likely be? So the persona started just to become a set of dimensions along which we could do the full design of the experience of being this kind of, for example, here, newly hired person in a medium-sized company. So you can see at the bottom there are opportunities. We use this as a framework and a space 
to start to prioritize where we invested on improving our product, which in this instance is the material to IO site, um, and the content on that site. So that's personas, ethnographic field work, contextual interviews, behavioral logging and personas, um, and that's all in the material space. So hopefully you can see how we're, we're really using a lot of HCI techniques from the consumer space in, in that material design space. In the Flutter examples, I just want to share a couple of examples with you. And in this instance, I want to focus on APIs. I won't do talk, talk about more tools more generally at all today, but I want to talk a little bit about APIs. So there are three pillars of API usability. There's documentation, which I also mentioned in the material context just now. Then there's tooling. And then there's API design. And today, I'm just going to focus on API design. And what I'm going to give you is a bit of a framework and a couple of examples that Tao and his team use every day routinely. I mentioned before that they do do surveys and so forth. But uh, this kind of um, approach to understanding API design is just routine and regular. So uh, again, back to that uh, ethnographic work giving you the ability to really see something in situ. One of the most important things about APIs is you can do cognitive walkthroughs or heur heuristics um, to do an analysis. But just like in the world of the designer and developer um, and the personas I mentioned, people have different cognitive styles and problem solving styles. And so really seeing the API in use in situ is really critically important. And one can sort of do very simple tests, but it's increasingly being able to get people to do things that are actually really important and realistic and ecologically valid, things that they would normally do in their lives, is really, really important. So these are from uh, the toolkit that Tao pulled together for other teams at Google to do API usability tests and just some best practices. So I thought that might be interesting to share with you. Um, firstly, you know, you've got to prepare the API you want to test. And then you have to come up with a representative programming task that can be accomplished using the API. Now, representative may mean that you need to go and actually talk to people about what their everyday activities are and what's representative for them. And our surveys can tell us what people are doing most commonly, as well as some of the behavioral logging. And then it's really important to moderate and observe the, the person trying to attempt the task and then decide based on results if we want to change tooling or documentation. And there are, as I said, quite a number of examples around um, changes that have been made in Flutter as a result of this method and approach and multiple different tests, including things like you know, um, error messages, using color to uh, make different parts of the error message more salient, just like in the uh, uh, screen interactions in material design. I talked about how color and shape uh, really affect the call to action and the, the human perception of importance. So in preparing in stage one, make a list of all of the API uh, aspects that you want to cover. Here is a list from Flutter from a few years ago, from app bar to um, block list view. That was a really interesting one because block list view, when the studies were done, turned out that nobody knew what that meant, so it got renamed. Um, and you can use APS test stubs um, if you need to. Second, specifying representing representative programming tasks. So really sort of thinking about making that very clear and what you would expect to see and, and laying that out uh, really carefully. As you can see, again, um, many of you will have uh, experienced this, but here's another uh, HCI UI principle of the use of color. Then the study setup. There's typically a study room with a participant and a moderator. Of course, in these times of COVID, you wouldn't be in the same room. Um, and then there's an observation room. And it's really critically important in the observation room that key partners from the development team, in this instance, the Flutter Dev team, um, leadership, as well as um, on the ground engineers, should be in the observation room. Because really seeing your, your, your tool in the hands of others is it's just it changes the way people think about um, what they're building. And it builds a really deep sense of I want to have empathy for my users. Because it's very easy to think, like I said earlier, that everyone's just like us. And that's not the case. Anyway, so the one other thing it's really critical to do is that you must 
tell the developer, the programmer, um, that this is about testing the tool, in this instance, Flutter, not them. Because reducing anxiety <laughs> and getting people feeling comfortable and allowing them to be very, very open and honest is a really critically important part. We also do a lot of think aloud. So again, this is a classic technique from HCI, um, which uh, I use actually in my PhD, which is having people think think aloud, talk about what they're doing and why they're doing it as they're doing it. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this as a technique. Um, it really, really uh, gets people to, to tell you what their mental model is and their mental process as they're going into something and you hear them problem solving. Another way to do this is to do pair programming around things because then you have two people talking to each other. Uh, so you might have two participants and one moderator and you, you listen to them problem solve together. So that's another technique. Here's the paper, the original paper, um, verbal reports as data. I, when I see this, it makes me kind of go, oh, because I remember reading this so many times when I was doing my PhD a long time ago. Um, so don't force them to remember retrospectively. A lot of people have people do tasks and then say what they did. Uh, but if you do it in the moment and maybe in a pair, you get the real on the ground problem solving. So here's an example. Let's see if I can get this to play. An exercise I'll just do. OK, something else. Let's try and load it. OK, green, five. That's simple enough. OK. Um, and then what exactly is this? I don't know. There you go. Very simple, I think. Um, so some more tips uh, is uh, really do know what you're looking for. Go in, if you like, with a set of hypotheses, even if they're weakly held, and let the participants solve the problem. I'm sure many of you who've done user experience studies know that it's so tempting to step in and help. And especially when we're looking at like complex programming uh, uh, skills being uh, worked, it's very hard not to want to jump in and help somebody. Um, do to keep track of the help you give and keep it to the absolute minimum. Um, and really, really, really look at the data you get and think whatever interpretations you have, just put them on hold, don't share them with the participant, and look at the data you get later. So those are classic, just good practice, I think. So. When you're trying to evaluate the results, the start, final stage, um, these are the sort of order um, of, of importance, if you like, the behavioral data, what the participant actually did. And I'll show you some of the ways we've been tracking that. Um, then look at what they said, then look at their retrospective account, and then look at opinions and predictions, maybe that you had or that they had, or that your teammates who are in the observation room had. But stick to the behavioral data. And I just wanted to share this with you because this is another open source tool from my team. Um, the person who built it, built it before they joined me, but my team, but uh, um, I hired them because of this. This is um, Paco. It's an experience sampling tool, typically used in the consumer space. And so what you would do as an experimenter is load Paco, um, build an experiment, and then you'd have participants, uh, as I say, typically consumers, um, do diary studies, so they will get an alert based on time or some action they took, and then they'll tell you what they're doing, and then you might go and interview them. We have used Paco extensively in ethnographic field work with consumers um, in another set of projects that I have been managing. But what we did with Paco is we actually changed Paco to it into a diary study tool on the screen for developers and instrumented IDEs, et cetera, so that we're getting diary studies and behavioral logs from people who have consented to be in our studies. This is an example, again, from Flutter, of the kinds of data that we would get. And the kinds of data, really, it tells us, for example, here what we're seeing is that people are jumping between different resources. So they might be you know, in you know, they're coding and then they're jumping out to Chrome, they're looking something up, they're coming back, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot more data here. You don't need to go into it, but I wanted to show the kinds of logs that we get. And for example, in this one, there was application switching that was going on and the number of jumps around was, we felt, excessive. 
And although the person, the participant, didn't complain, we took this to mean we really needed to improve some of our documentation and our support and help in our tools. So that behavioral logging can really, really help you. Um, so you've got these participants doing studies, but you can also do this kind of logging so that you, you're really getting at what the behavior is that may not be visible to you uh, in the moment, but you know, then you come back and go, wow, that's a lot of transitions. We want to reduce that because back to that efficiency argument I was making earlier, if you help people have an efficient, great experience, you can often improve the product because they're focusing on the right thing, which is the creative moment of getting the task done, not wrangling the tools. So th those are the three pillars. I'm not going to talk about the others, but there's another uh, thing that is happening a lot, especially right now, is that we're getting a lot of data from these streams. So live streaming, uh, problem solving, live streaming activity. Um, a lot more of this is happening for uh, pedagogical learning and collaboration reasons, and there's a huge amount of data for us there. So in your context, you might see people doing this kind of uh, activity. So to sum up, I'm coming up to my time. I just wanted to share a little bit of how we're taking HCI and UX approaches and ways of framing questions into the space of developer and designer experience and where there are some differences. Some of the differences are that um, the level of complexity is much greater. Um, often the tasks that people are doing are much longer and much more integrated. With a lot of consumer discretionary uh, applications, it's a very quick interaction in and out. You're not doing a lot of uh, really complex work. You're trying to make scaffold the end user to do a simple task very quickly or to make a task very simple. In the space between that and the developer experience is productivity tools like um, you know, calendaring and email. These are a little bit more complex and we need to really think about the end user experience in terms of, again, efficiency and effectiveness. Um, but I think it gets, it's very much uh, skews in, in the area of difficulty and integrated cross uh, tool experiences for developers. I told you a little bit about material uh, design and Flutter and shared a, just a few of the approaches that we've been using. Uh, so thank you so much. Again, Tao Dong uh, really helped a lot with this talk and Sarah Cambridge, her work on the ethnographic uh, a space has been absolutely tremendous for us. So thank you so much for your attention. And if you've got any questions and we've got time, I'm happy to answer. That's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. That was a fascinating uh, insight into, into uh, developer experience. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the, uh, the question thread and I'm kind of expecting it to, to fire up, but I have a couple of questions. Yeah. That, that maybe, I don't know, they're kind of related, so I'll ask them both together if that's okay with you. That's so, great. I wondered how kind of continuous deployment influenced your approach to, to kind of develop tools, you know, because in some way you've got a lot of operational data there now, you know, potentially right down on the, on the interface. And so how does that kind of get folded in and, and do you have things that help support and make some of the decision taking more evidence based? And then, then I also thought there's a kind of follow on from that, which is if we, if you then step back a level with thousands of developers all using your tools at once, do you then reflexively apply the same kinds of techniques? Yeah. And could you actually then start to use that kind of data to set the sliders on your personas for the developers, you know, so that actually you could make the decisions as to where the sliders sat on the basis of the, on the basis of the, uh, the, the information that you're getting from the developer use of the of the tool. You know, that's a really that's a really interesting idea. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I, I guess, yeah, <laughs> that would be kind of fun. Uh, I think right now the sliders are us doing the implementation, but actually sort of changing that up would be kind of fascinating. But your first question, my the team is very 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 deeply embedded within Flutter, very deeply embedded. And they, I mean, you know, there are almost daily meetings. Um, and we have the surveys I mentioned. We uh, have dashboards. Uh, Jia Yong Li uh, built a bunch of uh, dashboards, and she's an absolutely brilliant quantitative researcher. So 
we have constant surveys coming in. We have studies happening all the time, and it's very, very deeply embedded. And we at Google, we have OKRs, which are objectives and key results. It's basically, what are you going to do this quarter? And we work with the leadership team on Flutter to actually build in uh, OKRs. And mm -hmm. so the whole team is held accountable to address the end user data around satisfaction as well as behavior as well as activity. Mm -hmm. And so that very tight iterative loop and the prioritization of what the leadership team thinks is important directs where we pay our attention, um, but also where we find results that directs the leadership's attention to what is a priority. So it's very, very tightly integrated all the time. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is that uh, it's a very international crowd. So Flutter is being taken up very, very much internationally. Um, and we have a lot of people on the ground in various places, not in the team, but who are very active fan, fan people of Flutter. So we're getting constant feedback. And then there is a very, very strong communication around any time there's a new deployment of something through the blog and through um, essentially a customer advisory board uh, platforms and so forth. So I think what's different about this from a lot of uh, UX, consumer UX, is that often you'll have that the UX research team is separate from the production team mm. and you know, things get handed over. But we're so deeply embedded throughout all of the processes from, as I say, the objectives, key results, to the stand-ups, to the meetings, to the prioritizations. And I think that's a little bit different. But I like your, I like your slider idea. <laughs> <laughs> it just it struck me that, that, in a sense, you have such a large developer group now. You can start kind of thinking, thinking about those a little bit with, uh, with user glasses on, in some sense. Yeah, so yeah no, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so so thanks very much. I mean, I I, I oh wait a minute, there is uh, there is another question coming in. I, I thought it had broken briefly. briefly. Uh, <laughs> is it, it's the end of the day there, though, isn't it? So yeah, well, no, actually, actually, I found it extremely difficult to find the the question button at, at some point. Oh. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> so so th this uh, this person is wondering if, uh, given the amount of data you now have of API problems from developer studies, means you can start to categorize and potentially automatically detect them in design proposals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's so a growing interest in API design and, and anti-patterns, yeah, at Google, you know, yeah. so that's... Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and we're definitely, I mean, we're definitely, there's like so much data, there's so, we have a lot of insights. And as you say, not just detection, but prediction around where issues are likely to happen is mm. increasing. So, and that's where we start to do the tests and say, hey, so we're predicting that this is gonna be a problem in this context, is it or not? And we can do tests and so forth. One could imagine in some kind of future world that we're doing a lot of A-B tests around that, but we're not doing that right now. Um, okay. okay, no, that's interesting. And, and then Tim Storer, who asked the previous question, he's got a follow-up, which is, uh, could you design different APIs for different developer personas? Do you think? Do you think that that there might be a way yeah. of matching the two? Yeah. Yeah, I don't see. I, I seriously don't see why not. And you know, I was saying earlier that inclusivity is something that I really care about. And for example, cognitive problem solving style may be mm -hmm. quite different. So there's actually a really interesting uh, bunch of work that has been done by Margaret Barnett and her team in, in Oregon. Um, and she's, it's called Gender Mag, and she started off looking at gender differences in uh, the ways in which people problem solve and code and so forth. Um, and while she started off in the gender space, I think that what she has done, and she and I have talked for years about this, is actually start to push out and start to say there are cognitive problem solving styles. And there's a huge uh, field coming out right now, which is called neurodiversity. I don't know if you've heard about this, which is essentially different styles of learning, seeing, writing, problem solving. And I don't see why we wouldn't be able to adapt to those different cognitive styles. Because if you think about it, especially in, for developers, there, there are a lot of different tools that people use. And you set up your screen and your system to suit you and the way you work. I mean, it's not just developers, even when I'm writing a paper. You know, the way I set everything up, some people do outlines. Some people just start writing. 
you know, developers start using different tools. And, you know, it's got like, I've got all of my, you know, all of my, uh, my hotkeys, you know, and I'm still using Emacs, because why wouldn't I? I mean, you know, it, 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 people have very personal preferences. Hmm. And that is an expression of that diversity of uh, problem solving approach. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I mean, I guess there was a there was a whole period of work, wasn't there, on web design, which was looking at cultural specificity as well. So I guess there yeah. too, there's another whole thread, and certainly, yeah. if you look at the way that say proposals from small cultures, you know, if you look at something coming from the Faroe Islands, for example, and compare it with something coming from Germany, it's usually a very different form of organisation that underpins the the proposal for work or something like that. Yeah, so I guess absolutely, it's a very different. Okay, so look, thank you very much. That's great. I guess I'll, I'll let you, well, it's, it's later now where you are. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for a really fascinating insight into, into developer experience. And, uh, and I'm sure our audience- Well, thanks, but thanks for the attention. Good, okay. And thank you so much for the invitation. I hope everybody have a lovely day. Good, good. Okay, thank All you right. very much. Great, bye now. Bye.